Um, Devin, Ohio. There you go. That's a start, isn't it? Um, check out, check out Neil Young. If you're, if you're one of these <laughs> millennials, or you didn't, you know, you're married, but you didn't go that route. You were listening to other stuff. You might have been, you might have been into Motown. I like Motown, but you might not have liked all that political hippie stuff <laughs> like Dylan and all that. Check out. Neil Young, he's amazing. I have asked for your question. How are you, by the way? Um, hello. Let me know where you're um, watching from, listening from. Um, uh, New Jersey. Hi. Uh, how are you? I'm, I'm fine. Um, Chicago. So many Americans. Um, I didn't mean that. Uh, so many Americans. I mean... It's nice. <laughs> That's nice. It's nice that you tune in. Um, uh, and uh, anywhere in the world, thank you. If you're British, even if you're British, <laughs> right? I asked you some questions as usual. Um, Joey, the cat, came through. Uh, you have skydived off a plane. Off. Who's that on the plane? Is someone on the plane? Who's that on the plane? <laughs> right. You have skydived off a plane and land on an island, lucky, that has no human inhabitants. Right. It will take the rescue people a week to get to you. I know that for a fact. What would be your biggest challenge, fear? And what would you miss the most? Well, okay. Okay, so it's only a week. So I know that I'm going to be rescued. So I haven't got that sort of, that hopeless feeling that I'm going to die there. A fucking toothache. Or an infection. A scrape machine that I'm just going to fucking die of gangrene. As you do when you haven't got medical care. It's going to be a beautiful island. But I, I hope I... I scratch myself the first day and that fucking kills me. Right, so I know that might not happen. Um, well, it depends, doesn't it? No human inhabitants, that's good. I mean, that's a plus, straight away. That's good. Um, but are there, are there predators? Are there big... I mean, do I have to... What you need is water, shower, food. A week. That You, you can... But I'm, you know, if I'm going to get attacked by a fucking bear, or let's assume that it's like it's got no big predators. I don't need, I don't need weaponry, right? I've got to look out for poisonous fucking spiders. That'd be the first one, anyway. If I found a cave, I'd go, well, okay, cobwebs, forget it. I'm sleeping out on the beach. So I've got to find somewhere where. I assume I haven't got anything. I haven't got a knife. So I've just got to... I've got to make a bed and a fire, forage for some food, and find some water, am I? I mean, if there wasn't a stream or a river... I mean, I've seen it loads of times on those stupid programmes when you dig a hole and you put a bit of polythene. Where did you get the fucking polythene from? Where do you get that from? It just happened to have that. See? Fallen. And you put, you put a bit of polythene, but you dig a hole, you put a bit of polythene across and a stone in the middle and a cup underneath it. And the sun gets all the water out, right? And, the, and it uh, condensation, then it drips down where you put a stone, so it gravity, and it drips down the cup. You go, where do you get the fucking polythene from? Right? So that's, what do you do if you haven't got that? I've seen them get things that, you know, cactuses. But they might not be growing there. So if there's not a, if it hasn't rained recently, I don't know what I do. I suppose a lot of, if you eat a lot of vegetation, you'll get water if you stay out of the sun. Oh, I don't know. What's the biggest fear? Spiders. Yeah, I don't, well, the snakes though. Snakes would be a, um, 
I would just find a hole and just lie in it for a week. <laughs> uh, oh, here comes Rupert. <laughs> Rupert's a dog. You've you've woke up as an airline pilot in the seventies, all slick and sexy, with a massive moustache. <laughs> I'm in a plane again. You have to fly the plane, but which famous people from that era would you like to travel on board your plane, and why? Oh. Oh. So it was it like the seventies? So I could I could hang out with I could hang out with like Muhammad Ali and um, Paul Newman. Is that the sort of thing you make? Yeah, yeah. Uh, who else? Who else back in the seventies? So it's basically. I, that plane is me, Muhammad Ali, Paul Newman, David Bowie. <laughs> Just, <laughs> and then, yeah, but they all talk to each other and they go, who's the, who's the fella with the big moustache at the front slick back? Who's the, who's the fucking um, <laughs> fella from YMCA up the front? They pull the curtain across and they're having a great time and they go, ignore him. He's just, he's staff. He's just flying us round. So I'd, I'd be annoyed. And we go, fight in the other go, fuck, fuck with a lot of you. Get off. Get off. Um, Ollie Comic Strip. As a psychologist, I have a professional interest in various humorous mindsets because they're ability to help us cope with the harsh and absurd conditions of human existence. That's exactly what I think he was for, to get us over bad stuff. That's why we've got it. Uh, what values and belief system underlies your humorous mindset, would you say? Well, I think that what you explore in comedy, and it's not the same, doesn't mean the same as humour. Humour is something we, we have a disposition of, you know, uh, I suppose that's our that's our hardware and comedy is sort of the software. What do we do with it? What sort of things do we like? How do we explore it? How do we how do we um feed our humour, our sense of humour? Like what comedy do we like? What things do we like? Uh and I think uh, I think crucial to this is the fact that everyone wants to be taken seriously. That's what's funny. That's what's funny in comedy. That's why I don't think clowns are funny or people who try too hard. Someone jumping around just trying to be happy and like, are we having a great time? Like those fucking entertainers. They're like fucking red coats or fucking coach drivers. They're just like, isn't it? Hey, everyone. Let's have, are we having a great time? <laughs> like, no, clowns. I, 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 I look up at, fuck off. What's funny is someone who wants to be taken seriously and who isn't. That's what's funny. Someone who doesn't want to fall over and does. And that, that's true of anything. Like someone who wears a wig. It's funny because they don't want you to know they're bald. And you go, well, of course you're fucking bald. I can, see the, I can see the little bit at the back. Someone who wears a hat to try and be cool because they're going bald. See, so if somebody wants to be taken seriously, that's what's, that's what's funny. You know, ego, pretension, those things. Someone who's running along the street, pissed up, laughing, falling over, not funny. A businessman slipping on a fucking banana skin. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking. Um... Stonewall Rockhaven, if that is your real name. Um, when you write your comedies, have you ever found yourself laughing out loud at what you just wrote? Yeah, sort of. Obviously, the laugh comes before I have the chance to write it down. You think of something funny. And usually, it's a reaction, actually. 
going back to the other point, the person saying the funny thing isn't the end of the joke for me. It's how that lands. It's the reaction to it. So, you know, Gareth saying something stupid is funny, but Tim going, that's the, there's the almost another punchline. Brent saying something that he thought would be great, but it doesn't go down well. And then the faces of people just looking at him. That's, that's funny. The result, the result of something is funny for me. So usually I'm writing it and it's usually a character's response to something stupid or funny or ludicrous. Um, is there a lot of rewriting? Yeah, that's the fun bit. Writing is hard. Rewriting is fun. Writing is pushing your bike up a hill. And rewriting is riding it down. That's, you know, it's more fun and more dangerous. <laughs> it could go, could go terribly wrong. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the fun bit. And uh, it's simple to say what a rewrite is as well. Uh, I call a rewrite, if I've read it through and I've made a couple of little changes, I go, that's a rewrite. That's a rewrite. <laughs> um, Gunner, another dog. Very popular. I'm big in America and with pets. That's my... I mean, America is very lucrative. Pets. They've got no money. They've got no... There's... <laughs> Being a phenomenal thespian, playwright and director, you have absolute rule over your product you deliver. How do you tell when a scene needs to be stuck to script and when it can let loose? Like me peeing after drinking lots of beer. Um, <laughs> well, you've got the best of both worlds. You've written the script, you've written the screenplay, you've done all the structure, you've put, you write too much anyway. I write knowing that I can't possibly use all this. Like if I do, if I write 25 pages, I know that's gonna come in at, at least 30 minutes, easily. And uh, uh, so you do that, you do the screenplay bits first, and then I might go play with it, play with it a bit, let's do it, or I might think of something else and you add to it. So soon, you know, a half hour episode, it comes in at 45 minutes and you've got all those ad libs. And the dangerous bit is how funny objectively ad libs are. Because sometimes you've got the screenplay that you've worked on and you get bored with that. So when you do an ad lib and the crew laughs, because they haven't heard it before, you think, oh, that's the funniest thing in the world. But actually when you get in the edit and it's all equal, the screenplay stuff is often funnier. And even if it's not funnier, it's more valuable because it drives the plot because you've planned it. With ad libs, you do an ad lib that's the funniest thing you could say in that, but it might stitch something else up or not make sense or, you know. Um, so you do all those extra things, but in the cold light of day, the screenplay is, is worth more. Um, but those tiny little nuggets are, are great in an ad lib. Um, just like Ratty and the Nonce when we had fun, just just adding it and making getting it more and more stupid. Some most of them are unusable, but one or two that gets through uh, makes you laugh on the day and is funny in context as well. Um, and you've got you've got lots of goes at it. You've got the writing, the rewriting, the filming, and then you've got the editing. So you know. You sh if you can't get half hour comedy, um, you, then there's something wrong. Uh, B. 
any gems of wisdom you can offer to our young people during this time? Uh, I suppose you mean, are they missing... They're missing a, a big percentage of their youth because of the pandemic and university places and... Or just because... I, I don't know. Do they cope with it worse than fat old idiots like me? Well, in general, I, I'd always, what I'd always say to young people is, I'd have as much fun as you can. And that sounds like bad advice. That sounds like uncle's advice as opposed to friend advice. But I just think you can, you can never regret having fun because there's, there's no rush. I'd rather people that have just fun till they're 30 and think, oh, I better get a job than someone at 30 go, I'm wasted. I'm wasted my youth getting this great job. I, I really think that. I really think that. That's probably terrible advice. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy. Um, uh, Ronnie, Ronnie Eck um, says, what's your favourite French song? Oh. Uh, I mean, as a, as a sort of a real song. So I'm proud of the song. Probably Slough. Because if it wasn't silly lyrics, I'd be really proud of that as a real song. It's, I like the, the, the I like the chord structure and the arrangement, and um, it's a a good melody. So if I was a serious songwriter and they weren't silly lyrics, I'd say I'd say Slough, um, which you can still buy. Why don't you buy Slough? Why don't you just buy it now? Go on iTunes, right? It's 99p and buy Slough. I mean, I'm doing this fucking free. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is begging their fucking Patreon and you've got to pay for it and all that. Or they're sponsored or they want you to buy shit. What do I do? I try and get you to buy a red song that no one fucking does. <laughs> fucking hell. I'm the pilot of this plane, and you're disrespecting me. Um, uh, Sarah Louise Brett says, <laughs> if the French eat snails lavished in garlic butter, why haven't they tried slugs? <laughs> That's a good question, <laughs> it is, doesn't it? It is. That is a good question. I mean, you you can't say, they couldn't say, it is the shell. We like the shell. You don't like the shell because you don't eat the shell. So it's a very good question, Sarah Louise. Any French people <laughs> watching, if you, if you eat snails, which you do, <laughs> why don't you eat slugs? Why don't you eat slugs? It's a very good question. Oh, um, <laughs> very little difference. Very little difference. Both gastropods. One's homeless. And that's all. That's the difference. That is the difference between a snail and a slug. One is homeless, <laughs> and you get the one that isn't homeless, and you fucking pull him out of his house, eat him, and throw his house away. So, <laughs> um, right, Lorraine McMillan, Otis's mum, Otis is a parrot, got the humans getting involved. As you can hear, Otis pretends to be a squeaky toy to tease dogs and then starts laughing. Do you believe that animals have an actual sense of humour? Well... Two very broad, subjective questions there. One, animals. I mean, the gamma is incredible, astronomical, from a blob of protein to 
a great aim. That's so. Yes, some do. We do. I, I think. I think you'd have to say that chimps do. Chimps have a sense of humour, um, and I, I assume that decreases towards a blob of <laughs> shit on the floor. <laughs> That's an animal, but it's got no sense of humour, like a slug. Um, we know why snails haven't got a sense of humour because they keep getting eaten. But a slug hasn't got a sense of humour. You could tell a slug a joke and they go, yeah, for fuck's sake. Knock, knock. Uh -huh. Oh, you fucking blob. You fucking blob of shit. You blob of... You blob of slime. Imagine that a crowd full of slugs. You're doing a gig. Hello! What's going on with this? What about Brexit? Oh, you fucking blobs of... You fucking... Useless... Fucking... Twats. So... Yes. Intelligent animals certainly have a sense of humour. And what is a sense of humour? Well, they've actually done... Uh, they think that rats have a sense of irony, almost because they sort of like being tickled and they sort of, they laugh, but they're laughing because that's how they usually die. That's their, where they, they, they're, when they're usually on their back, it's because a, a cat or something is eating them, eating their stomach. And so some animal psychiatrists and scientists say that there is a sense of dark irony with this rat being tickled, because he's not dying. Does that make sense to anyone? I don't know. Um, Emma Dolan, is it? Yes. Is it true you once called your mum from a payphone and told her you'd gone blind? <laughs> <laughs> well, we used to wind my mum up. We used to wind everyone up. Everyone was winding up other people, right? All the fucking time, right? I told you, and I've, I've used it that my, you know, brother used to send postcards to m my mum saying, is that paedophile postman still reading your mail? She'd be horrified. If, my, if I saw my mum coming in the gate, right, I'd open the door, and we lived on the sort of the main road of the estate. So there's always people about, People, neighbours in and out, people walking past, cars, bikes, people robbing someone else's house, <laughs> two dogs shagging on the ball ring, right? So it was busy. So if she'd come in, like, okay, with a little scarf on, like that, uh, I'd go out the door and go, get out! She'd go, shove it, i go, get out, we've told you, don't come round here, and people would sort of look, and she'd be horrified. And she'd try to get in, she'd barge, she'd try, <laughs> it was like gladiators when you have to run past Rhino. And she'd be trying to get in the house, and I'd be going, get out, get out! <laughs> so, we used to wind her up. Um, so yeah, well, it was the first week I'd gone to college, and I'd called her on the Sunday, I'd been that week, and I called her from the payphone, and she went, hello? And I went, she went, I went, it's me. And she went, oh, um, where are you? Uh, just, uh, and I, for a laugh, I went, I'm in hospital. She went, what? I went, I think I'm blind. She went, what? I was, I was just, it was an ad lib. <laughs> I can nearly gave her an heart attack. So, yeah. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh god oh i just remembered right she used to make ends meet my dad like give her housekeeping bare minimum um and uh you know she did everything to make ends meet and if my dad one summer gambling like one summer on the horses or playing cards in the pub he had a wad of cash he th he'd keep that he liked that. Um, and he used to hide it under the carpet, right? So he'd pull up a bit of carpet right, in the regular world. And she found it one day, 
right? She must have seen a little one. And she found it one day and it's like, oh, what a cash, right? And so she thought, fucking hell. So she just took like a 20 or something and put it back. And what could he say? He couldn't say, Have you, did you steal some of the money I'm hiding from you? <laughs> so he couldn't say anything, right? And she told all of us, right? So it was like an in thing that when he found okay, she find his little, <laughs> right? And, you know, we just thought nothing of it. It was like a game. And then one day, um, my nephew, when he was little, he said to my dad, he went, Grandad, w would you like to um, win the pools or the lottery or whatever? And uh, my granddad, my dad went, no. And my nephew went, why not? And everyone was there. And my dad went, because the carpets would be like that. <laughs> so he knew. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh, dear. Families. Right, last question. Sorry if I haven't got to your question, but I get loads. And um, I, I can answer them during the week, can't I? Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should do a couple of little one-off questions and record them better as well, because obviously don't have to worry about the Wi-Fi. We could do a little masterclass. I'll just drop little, little one-minute bits of wisdom about writing or acting or whatever you want. Um, or maybe I can't be fucking bothered. <laughs> Ask me questions through the week. Not too many. Um, do a hashtag so I can find them. Because that's the other thing. I can't. I don't. I, I don't see them all either. Hashtag. Ricky's brought. Ricky's Wednesday. No, because I do two. Ricky's sermon. That's how he's gonna. Ricky's bollocks. Hashtag Ricky's bollocks. And ask me a question, and I'll find them. Um. <laughs> Not normal. Uh, Leslie Sutcliffe. Hi, Ricky. Um, we lived above my mum's poodle parlour. I have strong memories, feelings from my young age of watching her so gently groom all the dogs. Do you have a memory or something from where your passion and love of dogs began? Well, I was just born into it. It was the, you know... Um, uh, when I was born, uh, I already had a, a dog called Betsy. It was a little fat um, a fox terrier. So it probably looked a bit like Rupert, but with legs. Um, and my earliest memory, she was already an old, an old girl. Uh, and she, she waddled around. Um, and... Uh, she was just, just, she was sort of going blind and deaf. Um, and she was happy enough. But sometimes, the, if the, the wind blew the sheets, she'd see a shadow and she'd sort of get nervous <laughs> like that. And I remember, I remember feeling sorry for her when I was a kid, like, oh, she's a lovely little thing. Um, and my mum said uh, she used to guard me when I was a baby. Isn't that great? Aren't they fucking great dogs? Um, so yeah. And the first cat I had that died when I was about four or five was a, a, a fat gray thing called Smokey. And my mum's party trick was to sing on top of old Smokey. And I'd cry. So that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> so I think that's where it came from. I was tortured into it. I was tortured into loving animals. How was that? <laughs> um, and then I got my first, and then I, I, uh, my first cat was called Pavi, that was mine when I was little. I must have been about uh, six, seven. Uh, and then soon after that, I got my first dog after Betsy died, um, uh, called Lucky, a black Labrador. And uh, so, yeah, it was just one, 
one after another. And um, I've just always loved animals. I always thought it was a privilege to have them around. And I think they're amazing. Um, which brings me to this. That went well. That's going well, isn't it? Everyone, if you're going to buy a beer, just buy this one. All the, all the profits, if you, if you order this, all the profits go to um, Dogs on the Street and All Dogs Matter. So uh, cheers to Brewdog. And that started on here. We just giving them a shout out. Um, so hopefully we can we can get this going around the world. Maybe think of that. Cure the uh, the rescue pets problem. Um, thanks for tuning in again. I hope that was fun, informative, or nonsense. Uh, uh, Retweet it. It's the least you can do. I mean, literally, fucking least you can do. Well, actually, the least you can do is fuck all. That's what most of you do, is fuck all. <laughs> <laughs> Retweet it. By Slough. By David Brent. I like you. That'll make, that'll make Uncle Ricky happy, won't it? Um, so, uh, yeah, let's do this again. Uh, see you Wednesday. Have a great week. Be nice to animals. Tatty bye, everyone. <laughs>